So, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Salatu Salatu Salamu Rasulillah. So again, this is a new clip. So now I'm going to talk about another book uh, that I published. Uh, this is called The Wonders of Waqf. So I've called The Wonders of Waqf. It's actually a translation of three chapters from the book uh, the one from the, the marvels or the, the splendid things of our civilization uh, by Dr. Mustafa Sibai. Now, this book um, was the appendix, I think it was appendix C or D, to a book I did uh, about five years ago, in 2014, called The Book of Endowment. Now, what that book was uh, mainly was a translation of Kitab al Waqf from. Um, uh, the book Al-Mugni Muhtaj, Mugni Muhtaj in Shafi Fiqh by Al-Khatib Al-Shabini, which is his shar on the, uh, the Minhaj of Talibin of Imam al nawi So that's the main core of that book. There's an introduction from Shari Qut al-Nafis, which is like a summary of, of the book of Waqf, the, the Ahkam of Waqf. Again, if I didn't say so, that's in, it's endowments. The book of, that's what a Waqf is, an endowment. Um, and then there is uh, there are some fatawa in the book about Al-Qaf, uh, which I mainly took from the Nassim Sham website. And there's also this big chapter, or these three big chapters from the book, uh, <clears throat> Now, I chose this book as a start off. This, I wanted to give people um, a taster session, like a, a taste of what this book is. And I think this book, what, why, why I think this book is important is that we really need to think about drawing near to a law. We need to think about how we can invest in our afterlife because this is what a waqf is. I mean, Imam uh, Muhammad um, Mustafa al-Bugha, I put, his, I put his, his, there's a little section of his, from his book al-Fiqh al-Minhaji, which I quoted before, where he talks about waqf. He says, that's what he says, waqf is a means of drawing near to Allah, but it's also, it's also proof, waqf is proof of your belief in the hereafter, your faith in the hereafter, because waqf is the original meaning of, of salaqa jariya, like, like a, an ongoing charity. When you set up a waqf, this is something that will constantly be a source of reward for you after you've left this world. So that's a major reason for, for bringing this book into English now, or to, or to republish this section by itself. But it's also about because what I've chosen in these chapters is charities in general, and then there's a chair, and then there's a, a two more chapters, one on educational institutions like schools and madrasas, what we call madrasas, uh, universities, and then another one about hospitals and medical institutions. And through this, we can, we can have an idea, we can have an idea of the great things that Muslims achieved, how Muslims, uh, build, how Muslims build hospitals. Um, I'll give you for example, part of the reason why I translated the original Waqf book back in 2014 because I translate, what I translated first was the book, the, the lawful, uh, the, the book of the lawful, of the unlawful, uh, Kitab al Halal al Haram by Imam Ghazali, which is from the Ihya al Mudin. And inshallah, we'll be republishing that uh, maybe next year. I want to add the Arabic text and, and republish that next year, inshallah. Um, now, one of the things, now, that book overall is about wara, it's about carefulness, about avoiding things that could lead to the haram or are doubtful or dubious matters. But what Imam Ghazali does in that book is he actually talks about where governments get that money from. And for those of you living out here in the Anglosphere, we're, I think since 2008, we've been talking about austerity. That's been the word here, austerity, right? Meaning that governments uh, out in this part of the world are running out of money. And so what we're looking at here is where when governments run out of money, what it means is that governments have to cut services. And some of the major services that governments provide, especially in these countries like, like England, like the United Kingdom, is uh, health and education. So if health and education suffer, and again, like, we don't really want to be at those schools to begin with, what is the alternative? And so the answer lies here in this book, it lies here in WAKF. WAKF is how we can set up things where, edu where services like education and uh, schooling, uh, sorry, education and healthcare, are provided free of charge. So, for example, in the chapter on hospitals and schooling, uh, the author says this, as for the process of being admitted into the hospitals, they were free of charge for everyone. Because again, these are al-qaf. al is set up where, again, when the full book comes out, you can see the details, but essentially what you're doing is when you set up 
a, uh, a business or you have uh, some agriculture, like you have a field um, or a farm and there are proceeds coming out of that business or proceeds coming out of that farm and you're, setting those, and you're sending those proceeds towards this hospital or towards this metro or towards the school, this is how the money is coming in. So because all this, there's all this money coming in from businesses, it's, again, it's all private sector. All this money is coming in from the private sector into these institutions, which means what? No one has to pay for anything. So he says here, after the process of being admitted into the hospitals, they were free of charge for everyone. There was no difference between the rich and the poor, the near and the far, the noble and the unknown. First of all, the patients were examined in the outer hall. Because he's just giving a general summary, because he talks about what he does is he gives an example of the, the uh, Adudi Hospital in Baghdad, the Nori Hospital, the Grand Nori Hospital in Damascus, and then he mentions another hospital in uh, Cairo and one more in Marrakesh. So he says, so overall, this is what the system they had in place. This is, the, this is what these hospitals, these Muslim hospitals had in common. So he said, first of all, the patients were examined in the outer hall. Those who only had a mild illness were prescribed treatment and then they went to the hospital's pharmacy. Those whose illness required that they be admitted to the hospital had their name registered and then they entered the bathhouse. Their clothes were removed and they were put in a special waiting room. Then they were given hospital clothes and entered into the hall that was, specific, that was specifically for people suffering from the same illness. There's wisdom in that. Think about that. There's wisdom in that. If you, if you have an illness, a specific illness, whether, even if it's a, something like a flu or typhoid, whatever it is, you want to be with people who have the same illness. You don't want to be with people who have, you don't want to be with people who have other illnesses because then you can contract those as well. It's common sense. It's common sense. So, each patient was given his own furnished bed and good furnishings. Right? He's not sharing his, his bed or his, uh, his bedding with anyone else. Then he was given the medicine that the physician had designate, has designated for him and the right foods for his health in the necessary portions. Food's part of it. And I know what it's like. I've been in this country, you know, there's a time... Um, so I put, I put in a footnote here about how this is overlooked a lot because I've been in hospital in this country. I once had pneumonia. A lot cured me. So a but few years ago, uh, I would say going back maybe uh, seven, eight years, seven, eight years ago, I had pneumonia. I, I was in this country. I was visiting from abroad. I, contract, I contracted pneumonia and I had to go to the hospital. I had to go to the emergency room because I couldn't breathe. I had to go to the ICU, uh, the intensive care unit. And then I ended up in, in the ward. So my condition is stable, but it's, it's, it's Christmas Day. It's cold, obviously. It's cold outside. I have pneumonia. Now, pneumonia, if you know anything about pneumonia, it's, it's a cold infection. It's a cold bacteria in your system. And the way to address that would be to warm your body up. You warm your body up with warm foods. And I don't mean by warm cooked. I mean foods that have a warm constitution, a warm nature, like spices, uh, you know, certain um, like, like meats, for example, or eggs. I was being served in the ward. I was being served ice cold water. People would come by every few hours and give me ice cold water, not just water, ice cold water with ice cubes in it, right? And you know, alhamdulillah, I had the common sense to not drink it and say, no, can you take this away, warm it up, and bring it back to me? I'm not drinking ice cold water. I mean, if I had sipped that, I mean, subhanAllah, Allah knows what could have happened to me. So what I ended up doing in hospital it was I, 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 I told them I had to tell them to make me warm water then I had to make sure that whatever food they made me was warm I said can you, you know, do you have any like how many like I get some uh, some Asian food but that's what I got I got spicy food and then I started recovering but you know these are really important things we just don't think about this anymore that when you're sick you should be eating certain foods you can't you can't just be, be you can't just be when you're sick when you're sick, you can't just be eating anything. You need to be eating specific foods that will assist your recovery. So, uh, the author continues. He says, he says, he says here, uh, the patient's food consisted of meat from sheep, cows, birds, and chicken. And the sign of being cured was the patient's ability to eat a whole loaf of bread and a whole chicken in one meal. If the patient had recovered... Uh, sorry, if the patient had entered, if the patient had entered the recovery phase, he was transferred to the hall for convalescence. When he had completely recovered, he was given a new suit of clothes and a sum of money to compensate for the time that he'd been. That, uh, 
When he had completely recovered, he was given a new suit of clothes and a sum of money to compensate for the time that he had been unable to work. The hospital's rooms were clean with water flowing through them and its halls were furnished with the best furnishings. Each hospital had inspectors who checked for cleanliness and observers who looked over financial records and oftentimes the caliph or ruler would visit the patients himself and make sure they were being treated well. This is the system that was prevalent in all the hospitals that were established in the Islamic world. In the West, as in the East, in the hospitals of Baghdad, Damascus, Cairo, Jerusalem, Mecca, Medina, the Maghrib, Andalusia. And we shall confine ourselves to discussing, and we shall, and we shall confine ourselves to discussing four hospitals in four capital cities of Islam in those times. And that's what you can read in the book. Uh, the hospital in Baghdad, the one in Damascus, the one in Cairo. Uh, which I don't think I mentioned the name before. The one in Cairo is the Qalawun uh, Hospital, which is actually the one on the cover. That's the one I found this picture online. I put this picture on the cover. I think that's very, very important. Uh, the author goes into this one in a lot of depth, um, the Ibn Qalawun Hospital. Yeah, it's, 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 called, it's called the... Uh, so this hospital... So this, the third hospital is the, the Grand Monsori Hospital, known as the Bimaristan of Qalawun. Uh, Bimaristan, I think that word is familiar to some listeners. Uh, it's a Persian word. Um, and at the end, here's something interesting. Now at the end what he does is he, he wants to draw a comparison between what Muslims were doing 700, 800, 900, 1000 years ago, how they were running their hospitals. And then he draws a comparison with a hospital in Europe. And he quotes um, he quotes a statement from a French surgeon called, called uh, Jacques, uh, Jacques René Tenot. Um, and is, this is describing a hotel, it's called Hotel Dieu. It's, it's basically essentially a hospital in Paris. And this is the description he gives, of, this is how it was, and I think the year was, uh, this is in the, yeah, this is in the 1700s in the Christian calendar, right? Because Jean-Jacques Jean René Tenon, he dies in 1816. So, this is a basic description of what this hospital was like. So I want people to, to, to draw a comparison here. and Listen to this carefully. The hospital consisted of 1,200 beds, 486 of which were single beds. As for the rest, not even one of them was bigger than five feet. And you would find the number of patients on them fluctuating between three and six. The large halls were moldy and very humid, and there were no openings for air to pass through. It was always dark. You would always see about 80 patients sprawled out on the ground, piled on top of each other, on the floor, or on a pile of straw, a deplorable sight. Indeed, you would find on one average sized bed four, five, or six patients sticking together, the foot of one of them on the head of another. You would find children next to the elderly, women next to men, you might not believe this, but this is true, like uh, the author puts this in brackets. You would find a woman in labor pains going through convulsions with a child next to her that has typhus and is burning and the peak of fever. Both of them will be next to another. Both of, them will be, both of them will be next to another patient with a skin disease who will be scratching his lacerated skin with his bloody nails and then the pus from the pustules would, co would flow onto the covers. The patient's food was some of the vilest food that can be imagined and it would be distributed to them in tiny portions and after long, unregulated intervals of time. The nuns became accustomed to favoring the obedient, hypocritical patients at the expense of the others, and thus they would give them wine to drink and bring them sweets and greasy foods and other things that they would generously give them instead of the necessary diet, i.e. the necessary diet that would aid their recovery. All right? You are what you eat. As a result, many of them died of indigestion while the others died hungry. The doors of the hospital were open every second of the day, letting in every foul odor, and this is how infection spread by being transferred as well as, well as via excrement and filthy polluted air. If charitable people were not kind towards the patients, they died hungry, just as they died sometimes of indigestion or excess sugar. The mattresses carried vile insects, and the air in the room was so foul it was unbearable, so much so that servants and nurses would not dare enter unless they had placed sponges dipped in vinegar over their noses. Dead bodies will be left for at least 24 hours before being removed from the beds they shared with others. Oftentimes the, bed, the, oftentimes the dead body would disintegrate and decompose 
while next to another patient who was on the brink of losing his mind. So that's the end of the quote. So these are some things to think about. I mean, we, you know, we live we live here in this uh, situation. Again, like, you know, why this book is important, where we now look to in the Muslim because I live in the Muslim world, and it's shocking to see Muslims over there and even Muslims over here, just totally enamored by the Western medical system. You know, what, what is Western conventional medicine? Even when a lot of people in the West, a lot of people, you know, especially in the United States, I'm seeing this a lot, they have massive doubts about conventional medicine, and they're setting up their own clinics and their own hospitals and turning towards holistic approaches, homeopathic medicine, and so forth, because they know it's a crock. But a lot of Muslims are falling for this stuff, believing that they have to uh, accept the Western medical system, what's called conventional medicine. They need to accept these pharmaceuticals. They need to accept the treatments that are given to them uh, by these doctors. And also, we fall into these systems where we, we also believe, this is, the, this is the main point about WAC, is we believe that this medical care has to be funded by the government or it has to be funded by insurance. And no, we have all these examples of, in our history of Muslims funding this entirely through the private sector. Entirely through the private sector so the patients never have to pay anything. And this is a beautiful example of this book. So you, 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 what I read for to you there, a Muslim would go to a hospital get checked, because he has some sort of ailment, if they feel that he needs to stay in hospital, they give him his own utensils, his own bedding, uh, his own clothes, and then when he's recovered, I don't think if I read it out there, but I did read it, it's in one of the hospitals, it mentions that, uh, this is something normal, that someone would, when they finished their recovery and they're leaving hospital, from the walk, on the, these, these various okaf, that's the plural, these okaf that fund the hospital, the patient would be given money after leaving the hospital to make up, because he's missed days of work, obviously. He's been sick. He hasn't been able to work for five days, ten days. So they give him money to make up for it. Sometimes they would give him even more money so that he doesn't rush back to work. So, you know, now you need to go home for a few days to rest and then go back to work. These are all things that are in place. There's even one example which uh, really struck me regarding one of the hospitals that the author mentions, where someone set up a walk where they would, where someone would be paid to walk up and down the ward and get within earshot of a patient and say something good about him. Right? Not talk to the patient, but just stand within earshot of him and say, hey, that guy looks better today. He doesn't look so pale anymore. He looks, like, he looks a bit better. He's coming along. Right? And what's that? We, we call that now in, 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 uh, in the Anglosphere, it's called the power of suggestion. People went to that extent. Uh, in sending out Okoff. Now, regarding uh, educational institutes, okay, so now some other examples before I go into schools. Here's some other examples that uh, the author gives, um, like these examples of Okoff that were set up. Um, and he talks, he calls these social organizations. So he said, for example, there were social organizations made for repairing roads and bridges, as well as those for graveyards. People would donate vast amounts of land so that it could be a public graveyard. This is an example of a walk. There were also organizations for buying burial shrouds for the poor, washing them and burying them. As for social organizations in order to establish social solidarity, these were the wonders of wonders. There were organizations for foundlings and orphans. Foundling being a lost child who's found, you don't know who his family is, and you can't connect them with their family, you can't bring them back to anyone. There's no relative, basically, to reconnect them with. So there were organizations for foundlings and orphans and for their circumcision and care, organizations for the infirm, the blind and the physically disabled, and they lived therein. They were treated with dignity and they were provided with everything they needed, such as housing, food, clothing, and also education. And he goes on. He says there were also organizations to improve the conditions of prisoners, raise their living standard, and provide them with the necessary nourishment to maintain their health, as well as organizations to provide the blind and infirm with people who can guide them and serve them. There are organizations... Uh, to marry young single men and women. So we look in the history, we find this. There are organizations to marry young single men and women who themselves or their guardians do not possess the financial means of marriage and offering bridal gifts. Right? Which is, I, I mentioned this earlier before when talking about uh, the fact that a, a bridal gift, the, the, the mahr is, is given by the man to the woman. And he, said, and he says, the author he says, how wonderful was this compassion and how great is our need for it today. Uh, one of the charitable acts of Salah al-Din al-Ayubi was to place in one of the doors of the citadel 
which is still there in Damascus, a pipe from which milk flows, and another pipe from which sugar and water flows. Mothers come two days out of every week and take the milk and sugar that they need for their infants and children. Uh, one of the shining examples of charitable organizations is the, the Zabadi endowments. These are called the Zabadi. Right? Zabadi means yogurt, uh, literally in Arabic. For children who break the Zabadi while on their way home. It's a, it's a yogurt dish. right? So it says here, they come to the or- this organization and take a new Zabadi in exchange for the broken one, and then they go back to their families as if they had not, had not done anything. So what we learn from an example like this, this is what's amazing, is that Muslims were setting up al qaf and they're funding so many different things. They're funding so many different things that people have to be creative and think, okay, where can I put an endowment? Okay, their schools are set up, hospitals are set up, there are charities for this, charities for that. Okay, what can I set up? Okay, I've noticed that there are children who go out, they buy yogurt for their families, and on the way home, they trip and they drop the, the yogurt and it breaks. They, they drop the yogurt dish and it breaks. Okay, I'll set up a waqf. So that if that happens, or when that happens, the child can come to this walk, get a new get a new zabadi, a new yogurt dish, bring it home, and no one's the wiser. They won't get into trouble with their, their they they won't get into trouble with their parents or whatever it is. Okay. Um, and then he says this: the last thing we will mention of these organizations is the organizations that were set that were set up. And this is something really really uh, uh, touching, I think. He says the last thing we will mention of these organizations is the organizations that were set up to treat sick animals or to feed them or to care for them when they were no longer able to work, as was the case with the Green Meadow in Damascus that now has a municipal stadium on it. See, which is sad. Because sometimes they all cough, they're not maintained, and they fall out. And they fall out of existence. It was an endowment for horses and animals that were old and unable to work, and they were taken care of for their remaining days. So the author, he finishes this chapter and he says, these are 30 examples of the charitable organizations that emerged under the shade of our civilization. So can anything comparable be found in any other nation? Can comparable examples be found for many of them in the shade of the current civilization? By a law, it is the path of eternal life that was uniquely ours in the days when the entire world was in heedlessness, ignorance, backwardness, and darkness. By a law, it was the path of eternal life through which we revealed a humanity that was tortured by its pain and suffering. So what is our path today? Where are those hands that would wipe the tears of the orphan, nurse the wounds of the wounded, and bring our society together, in which all people can enjoy safety, goodness, dignity, and peace? So this is obviously the author explaining why this, why he put these chapters together. And they are a very moving chapters. So what I intend to do with this, uh, inshallah, because I think I'll... And we're wrapping this up. So what I intend to do with this, so this is a taster, inshallah, of what waqf, you know, to give you historical examples of waqf. And this is something for Muslims to feel uh, proud of. I don't mean that in a bad way, but something to be proud of. To, to look at what our civilization created. Don't have this inferiority complex and think that, you know, world history started 200 years ago with, you know, the, well, that, that don't, don't think that world history started 240 years ago with the founding of the United States or uh, you know, the early days of the British Empire. No, we have a rich, rich history. Right? The world is not Eurocentric. The world is not uh, dominated by European civilization, European culture. There's a lot out there. So I would just say that this book will, inshallah, put some pride and respect back inside of you and, and you won't feel inferior if you have that complex insight, you won't feel inferior when you look at uh, the achievements of Western civilization. And I think that's crucial. But inshallah, I will, in the next year or so, uh, publish the original Waqf book, including this, uh, probably include the Arabic text and put that out again. And then from that, inshallah, I am hoping to that, that people will take the, the fiqh that's in there and start implementing that. So, so these are examples to inspire you. You can learn a lot from these. Set up your own Waqf, inshallah. Because again, a Waqf, does not always have to be a big project. It doesn't have to be like a hotel or apartment building or uh, a hospital. It doesn't have to be like that. A waf can just be an object. You can give uh, a book or a mushaf to a masjid. You can give a chair to a masjid. Right? You, if you want to do a qaf, you can start small and then think about uh, bigger projects in the future.